that we believe allow us to help make those connections. Uh, Raptors provide critical ecosystem services, so meaning apex, apex predators, uh, you know, having those hunters in the ecosystem is incredibly important to maintain those ecosystems. Um, vultures provide an incredible ecosystem service. Um, they remove pathogens from the environment like anthrax and botulism. Um, so they are incredibly important in the ecosystems in which they are found. They also indicate biological health. So when we see predator numbers decreasing, like raptor numbers decreasing, we know there's probably something going on in that ecosystem as a whole. So by monitoring them, watching them, it um, can give us a heads up because they're often the first uh, animals to really take a hit when the ecosystem starts to fail. There's also a centuries-old relationship between humans and raptors. Um, the sport of falconry has been going on for thousands of years. We actually don't even know what part of the world it originated in, if it originated in the Far East or the Middle East. So this cooperative hunting between an animal and a human, um, and this relationship has been going on for so long. Uh, also, we tend to name our sports teams after them, and <laughs> our cars, and we use a lot of raptor imagery. Um, I don't need to tell anyone that the bald eagle uh, is, has a symbol in this country as well. So there is a connection there. People uh, really are pulled into these animals. Uh, sadly, 18% uh, of raptors globally uh, are in decline, or, or excuse me, face extinction. So these individual species um, are, are at the brink. And then 52% of global raptors are facing decline. Uh, some of the hardest hit groups of, of these birds are the old world vultures. Um, in some places, old world vulture populations are have lost 90% in the last decade. Um, in Afri there's an African and an Asian vulture crisis going on currently. So it's a really, really uh, big problem. Um, for those individual uh, species. So, what is a raptor? This kind of this picture sums it up. Uh, raptors are avian predators that hunt using their feet. So they're not the only avian predators. They're just the only avian predators that use their feet to do uh, their hunting. Uh, they are obligate carnivores. So that means they have to and they only eat other animals. So powerful feet, we call those claws on the end of their toes talons. Uh, they all also have short downward curved beaks. So not beaks that you want to hunt an animal with. The beaks are really short, they're close to the eyes. So, you know, herons, great blue herons, can kind of visualize their beak, right? They're not raptors, they are predators. They're using that sword-like beak to hunt. Um, so raptors are never using their beak to hunt. They're always using their beak. Um, interestingly enough, and nobody quite knows the answer to, to why this is, but in all raptors, the females are generally larger than the males, sometimes significantly so. And also, which I find really interesting, is there's three really distinct evolutionary paths that uh, raptors uh, came from. So I'll kind of highlight that later, but owls and falcons are not closely related to any of the other raptors. So it's an example of convergent evolution uh, to this hunting style. So I'm going to give a quick list of kind of the groupings. These are loose. Um, names get flipped around and changed, but I'm going to try to, I get asked these questions like, what's the difference between a hawk and a falcon? So I'm going to do a little of that this evening, um, and I'm going to start talking about the different types of raptors. So one group of raptors is the soaring hawk. So broad wings, uh, red tail would be our example. Uh, forest hawks, what we like to call true hawks in uh, the raptor world. So 
the ones that zip around and maybe uh, catch the birds that are hanging out at your bird feeders are the forest hawks. Uh, carriers are another unique group, kind of interesting, most owl-like daytime hunters. Kites, osprey, um, there is a wonderful osprey nest very close to where we're giving this talk tonight, so the fish hunting specialist. Uh, fish eagles, so eagles is a really terrible word. Um, eagle just means really big raptor. And there's several different groups of really big raptors. One of them is a, a fish eagle. Another group of eagles is a muted eagle. We have examples of all of these different groups in Oregon. Owls, got my little asterisk because they're evolutionarily different, but they're still raptors. Falcons, um, as well, have that different evolutionary track. And then vultures. I put three asterisks on vultures because <laughs> vultures are complicated. <laughs> um, vultures are really cool. I love them, but uh, people can't quite decide what to do uh, with where our vultures here in the New World should live. Like what group of birds should they be with? Because they don't actually hunt using their feet. It's awkward, um, but yet they seem to be most closely related to these daytime raptors, the soaring hawks, the kites, the osprey. Um, however, if you were to go to Asia or Africa and look at the vultures that they have there, take a look at their feet. They have very powerful feet, and they look much more like raptor feet than the vultures here. So it's pretty certain that those vultures are very closely related to this group of birds that we call the raptors. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So let's talk about soaring hawks. Um, we have five different groups, or five different species, excuse me, of um, soaring hawks here uh, in Oregon that we can find. The red tail, red shoulder, uh, rough-legged, swainson, and the Ferrugian. Uh, they have incredibly broad 
wing and a broad tail. So this is a red tail um, artifact, really broad wing, a really broad tail, perfect for soaring. These guys specialize in grabbing thermals, riding those thermals in kind of an effortless flight, um, basically making their own perch up in the sky. Uh, or they find a tree branch and they're perching past predators because they like to perch, look, pounce. And of course, red tail hawks are one of the most successful raptors in these human altered habitats that we live in. So, famous red tail, name of pale male, uh, built his nest and had very lots of uh, late friends um, over the years, but re raised his offspring in New York City. That was pretty successful. Uh, forest hawks. The northern goshawk, Cooper's hawk, and sharp shin hawk are the forest hawks. Again, referred to as true hawks. And here we have a that other picture was a northern boss hawk. They have a, the white eyebrow. They look like they're real serious all the time, which they are. <laughs> have this most amazing um, kind of disruptive camouflage pattern um, on their chest. Cooper's hawk, also a pretty successful suburban hawk. And they also really love the fact that one of the most uh, Increasing pastimes in America is outdoor bird feeding. Backyard bird feeding. They love it. They love it. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, and then the sharp chip hawk, the smallest of the three. People often ask me, how do you tell those two species apart? Uh, kind of hard. Probably, most likely, you're seeing a Cooper's hawk. That's probably like a good place to go. Cooper's have like a little bit of a square head. Um, Sharpshin hawks, we don't have them uh, in the Eugene Springfield area, except for in the winter, they're kind of coming through. So they nest at higher elevation. Uh, the juveniles are kind of maybe coming down the mountains right now. They are also hunting those birds. They're significantly smaller. They're so tiny. Uh, but they are very difficult. So uh, their genus is the Sipiters. So short, rounded wings. I'm going to take this picture. This is um, our northern goshawk up at the center. His uh, wings are way up here, and then he's got a crazy long rudder-like tail. So if this was a red tail, those wings would be way down here. So that really short, rounded wing. Uh, and a long rudder tail. These guys are pursuit hunters. They can turn on a dime. Uh, they are hunting on the wing, hunting those songbirds. They're cutting through in and out of trees. So to give you an idea of a red tail and a cooper's hawk, just like size difference on their wing. But check out how long that, this is from the same individual, how long that tail is yeah. on that Cooper's hawk. I mean, it's really, there are a lot of tail, they have a lot of tail. So, um, really designed for that, for that speed. Uh, they also have really, really long, skinny toes um, as well. So, raptors that hunt other birds have to have these long skinny toes to get in and underneath feathers. Um, if you were to grab a bird and not have those, you might just get feathers and you might not get the bird. Um, this is one of the bootios, kind of that thicker toe. Kind of a, more of an all-purpose pose. <laughs> okay, harriers. We only have one species of harrier uh, here in Oregon, actually in all of North America, the northern harrier. Um, used to be called the marsh hawk. They're not hawks at all. Um, <laughs> not hawks, but that's what, if you have old field guides, they're called the marsh hawk. Um, they're different. They're not sorry hawks. They're just harriers. Um, notice the color. This is a female. 
female northern harrier. And then this is a male northern harrier. So they're one of the few uh, raptor species that the males and females have a different color. So the females are, the, are that kind of chocolatey brown, the males are gray. Um, interestingly enough, they're one of the few raptor species as well where the male can actually have several uh, females that he's providing food for for all of their offspring. Um, usually, it's that's just a lot of work to provide enough food for carriers and we'll do that. They have really pretty both long wings and long tails, and they are can be seen quartering or harrying over open fields. So they're an open field grassland predator. Um, they have the most amazing flight back and forth. They can also almost fly straight up and down. And it's one of my favorite things to go out, um, even just out here to the West Eugene wetlands and watch carriers fly because they're just an incredible aerial acrobat. They're primarily hunting um, small rodents. They do have an owl-like face. So it's thought that this kind of facial bit actually may be important for them um, to use auditory cues to also find their prey. Now, there are daytime hunters, but they do have this facial disc which they can control and glare out. And facial discs funnel sound into ears. They nest right on the ground, usually in tall grass, and can really be um, ID'd by a bright white patch. Now, this is the Cooper's hawk tail, but I'll use it to illustrate. Uh, where their tail meets the body, right here, is a bright white patch of feathers. So that distinctive white rump patch is the key to um, so ID'ing them. Does it show up on the male as well as the female? Yep. And as I said earlier, one of the few species where males and females have different different colors. <coughs> the, male, the young males actually look like females. They're that brown. Uh, that their first molt, they will they mold into that a silvery gray. Kite. We have one species of kite here in Oregon, the white-tailed kite. Um, if you have old field guides or old bird books, they might be listed as the black-shouldered kite. Black-shouldered kite and white-tailed kites look very similar. black shoulders are found in the old world. Um, and they split them into two separate species now. Um, so we have the white-tailed kite. This is also a relatively new bird to Oregon. So in the last uh, 15, 20 years, uh, this species has been extending its range northward. They were overwintering here at first, and now um, they are uh, breeding here. Uh, so again, one species, this is again a recent breeding species here in Oregon. They were overwintering here first, um, and now they breed. Again, they're uh, same, same similar habitat to the northern harrier, uh, that open grassland, uh, go out to the west Eugene wetlands, or maybe Finley. Uh, they're seen hovering or kiting over open fields, is how they get their name. They are able to really maintain uh, a position build a perch out of nothing by just going back and forth with their wing looking for uh, rodents, so they're a mouse hunting specialist. They have the teeniest, tiniest, little stubbiest mouse catching toes you've ever seen. <laughs> Osprey. Um, Osprey are uh, a fishing raptor and a fishing specialist, and there is no raptor quite like them uh, in many regards. So, being a fish hunting specialist, they have feet that are really quite big, and their talons are like fish hooks. Nobody has talons like an osprey. 
And on the bottom of their feet, they have, their scales are specialized into these spiky spicules. So if you've ever tried to hold on to a fish, you might know how slippery it is. This really helps a lot to hold on to um, that, that fish. So really specialized um, feet for that. Uh, they're able to actually dive under the water and grab a fish and pull themselves up. So that is a really a huge feat to be able to do, to be able to fly, dive in, grab the fish, and then break the surface tension of the water and pull yourself back out. So bald eagles, they just scoop a fish off of the surface. If they land in the water, the bald eagle lands in the water. It's sad. They can do it. I've seen video of it. They doggy paddle the shore and try to dry <laughs> off. They can't take off from the water. They're just too heavy. So an osprey has the body size of about a red-tailed hawk. And they have a wingspan of about a bald eagle. So they are a lot of wing. And the wing actually even has a slightly different placement on their back. Um, their wings are kind of a little bit like back on their shoulders a little bit, so they can even get a, a bigger open to break that surface tension. Is there a limit to how deep they can go? I, that's a great when question. When they plunge into the water, because... I don't know. That's a great question. I mean, mentally, I'm thinking maybe just three or four feet at the most, but I was just wondering if anybody had ever reported that's a great question. I mean, we get to see them here in the Willamette a lot in the yeah. summer. Yes, we do. Yeah. Um, and they're actually, so they're also a migratory species. They're kind of on the road. Um, they're leaving to uh, Central uh, and Central America primarily, um, some of Northern uh, South America. But we also have some individuals that are, have been staying year-round in Oregon, um, especially on the Oregon coast. And you think it's really interesting to watch an osprey hunt the river. <laughs> Cross your fingers that you're lucky enough someday to watch osprey hunt the surf. Wow. Because that is really fun to see, um, for sure. Um, to have to watch them just going in and out. You've got a lot, a lot of space to see, so I've been able to see that. So there are individuals that um, do stay year-round. Um, interestingly enough, uh, you know, osprey are just, they're unique. They're their own genus. There's nobody else quite like them. And they're found on every continent uh, except for Antarctica. Okay. The fish eagles. So, um, not all eagles are created equally. <laughs> they have different groups. Uh, so, the fish eagles is, is a group of eagles that have been kind of lumped together. They're, they're evolutionarily close to one another. They tend to breed near water. Um, they do fish, but they do a lot of other things as well um, that, are, that are similar. But uh, we do only have one species uh, here in, in North America, the bald eagle. So the stellar sea eagle, the African fish eagle, these are all different types of fish eagles. They do a lot of fishing, but it's not exclusive. So they tend to live and breed near water. Uh, we have so many bald eagles in this state, and we get, we'll get be getting more shortly, because a lot of the eagles from Canada and Alaska over here as well, especially on the valley floor, because they also really don't mind scavenging. They don't mind eating dead stuff. Um, and we have a lot of lamb uh, and sheep in the valley, and afterbirth and stillborn lambs are awesome. I've been told. Um, for these guys. And you'll see like huge, huge groups. Um, there are some groups up. Uh, in the valley up by Corvallis, where you can see 40, 50 bald eagles coming into roost in, in at night. I mean, there's just a lot of these guys. Uh, they also have one other really, I like to see yes. this one. That's very, <laughs> yeah, that's well, it's a scientific term, uh, kleptoparasites. Yeah. They are also not above just taking whatever another animal has already killed. <laughs> um, well, one of their favorite. 
favorite things to do is, yes, they steal. Their favorite thing to do is to sit around, watch an osprey, until an osprey catches a fish, right? And then as the osprey catches the fish and starts flying, they're hot on their tail. And they, um, they will, Osprey learn just to give up the fish. Uh, because they will kill Osprey just to get the fish. So, uh, same with peregrine falcons. So will just watch peregrine falcons. Peregrine falcons love to come down to the valley and hunt ducks. They'll just watch peregrine falcons but they don't see ducks. So,
you get uh, meat, if they rely on their hearing, their facial discs are very big, uh, like a great gray owl, like a dinner plate, or they can hear mice underneath snow. Uh, primarily perch and hound predators, and they're not closely related to other species of raptors. Uh, falcons, we have five um, different species that can be found in Oregon. I'm just going to skip to the next so we can uh, talk about, I'll go from biggest to smallest. Uh, the jeer falcon is an infrequent visitor. Uh, they're an Arctic species primarily, but they are occasionally found in Oregon during the winter. Uh, peregrine, prairie, uh, eastern Oregon falcon. The merlin here, a small raptor that we own, uh, they are only here in the winter, the merlin. Uh, then on the American kestrel, the smallest and most common of the falcons in North America, the merlin. So, uh, falcons are most closely related to parrots. They have incredibly um, long pointed wings. They are fast, fast, fast pursuit hunters, but they're open country hunters. So the, the forest hawks are complex environments. Um, the falcons are all open country hunters. They need a lot of space. They do have long toes because they're primarily catching birds. Um, their toes are pretty weak because they're so long and skinny, but on their upper bill, and you can see it here, they have a little notch. It's called a tomial tooth, um, and it's used uh, to break the neck of their prey. It, it's just like a can opener. It just suffers the cervical vertebrae. And they have these perfectly round little nostrils um, with little jet engine intakes. They're like, uh, they're called tubercles, but they look like little miniature jet engines. And it's thought that helps keep the air moist and warm, especially for a bird like a peregrine falcon who can dive at 250 miles per hour. Because that would actually make most animals pass out because you wouldn't be able to get enough air. But because of how that nostril is shaped, air flows, it's warm, and they don't pass out. Vultures, we have um, the turkey vulture here in Oregon, and historically, the California condor. And maybe, hopefully, again, soon, the California condor. Um, they can continue really well with their conservation breeding. Maybe they will be released again in the Columbia River Gorge, where they were historically found. Keep our fingers crossed. So the vultures here in Oregon are obligate scavengers. So they never kill another animal. They only eat animals that already died. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Old World, so Europe and Asia, um, in the New World, the Americas, the vultures are not that closely related, um, but they all provide a critical ecosystem service. So, botulism, anthrax, tuberculosis, you know, keep rabies, all of these different diseases that an animal might die from. Vultures can ingest that, they don't get that disease, and anything that comes out of it doesn't carry that disease. They absolutely eliminate these really terrible pathogens from the environment. So we're really big fans of vultures um, up at the center. So just the, their ability to do that is amazing. In um, India, where the Asian uh, vulture crisis is at its worst, the cases of human rabies is through the roof. You can imagine, like people getting rabies. Just huge, huge increase because the vultures have died. Um, there's no uh, wild dog packs are eating these uh, carcasses. They're getting rabies and they're biting people. Huge numbers of rabies cases. So. All right, I want to talk about a few really awesome successes um, that we've had in recovering some um, raptors that we almost
So osprey. There's reports in the 50s how osprey were just incredibly abundant across North America. Any waterway, any river, reservoir, lake, there were osprey. In the 60s, depending on what part of the country we're talking about, there was a half to a, th a three-quarter decline uh, across the U.S. in the osprey population, really pretty rapidly um, during the early 60s. Do they know why? We talk about it a lot with the peregrines. People don't talk about it with the osprey. So, and the bald eagles as well, that's right. So, osprey are hunting animals out of water. DDT was flowing into waterways. Fish were getting it. They're apex predators. So, osprey were also really almost decimated from DDT. And unfortunately, people put that all together. DDT was banned. 72 was also uh, when the Clean Water Act was passed. There's also, um, you look at charts as, as rivers got cleaner, uh, osprey numbers increased as well. Um, and in the 80s, in a lot of places to try to bring back um, osprey, the artificial nest platforms were installed. So we've got a nice example of an artificial nest platform on top of the law school, um, uh, right next door here. So uh, osprey like the tallest open spot to build a nest. So that used to be the track and field. <laughs> and now um, I help move them over. They put something a little bit taller with a nice platform. Uh, osprey are very not, no problem. With artificial nest platform, they'll, they'll do it. So osprey numbers continue to um, increase and are getting back to historic numbers. Um, bald eagles. Uh, in 63, 1963, there were 487 nesting pairs of bald eagle in the lower 48. Alaska was not seeing the same problem. Canada was seeing the same problem. But it was a, that was a pretty big drop. Again, DDT was banned. Um, and also bald eagles were kind of one of the uh, charismatic megafauna that was used to get the Endangered Species Act to pass. Bald eagles were put on that list. You know, people could get behind it. They understood uh, why this was an important effort. A lot of recovery plans in the 80s. So uh, a lot of conservation breeding, taking individuals from Alaska, um, uh, breeding them. Because bald eagles go back to uh, about where they were hatched. So you can't just like bring a young bald eagle and put it in Nebraska and hope it stays there. You actually, it has to kind of grow up in Nebraska and become familiar. It'll migrate and go somewhere else in the winter, but then it'll come back to where it was hatched. So um, individuals were being raised in new locations where there weren't eagles. And in 2007, they were able to be delisted from um, the threatened and endangered species list. Peregrine Falcon. 1964, there were no breeding peregrine falcons in the eastern United States. Zero. Uh, in 1973, they also were put on the endangered species list. And some of the most intensive conservation breeding plans ever were put into place. So we really almost lost the peregrine falcons. Um, uh, the falconry community in this country is to thank for this recovery because they said, you know, you know we've got our hunting birds, you know, our the birds that we're using in falconry, we'll stop hunting, we'll, you know, we'll breed these individual animals, we'll, we will reintroduce them, uh, and of course you can go see the exhibit for a few more days. It's really, it's a fascinating success story. Uh, and really could not have happened without falconers. And in 1999, peregrines were removed from the endangered species list. It's just really amazing. 2007, I mean, look at that increase. It's estimated a 2,000% increase from the 1960s. 
when you go from yes. zero. But it's amazing. Uh, peregrine falcons are nesting on, on buildings or cliff nesters. Skyscrapers, fortunately, are kind of like cliffs. Um, but here in Oregon, I highly recommend going up to the Yakina Lighthouse and seeing some peregrine falcons that nest out there. Um, right by the visitor center, there's a nesting pair on the cliff there. It's amazing. I wanted to highlight two really concerning species, the northern spotted owl, um, listed as threatened in the 1990s here in Oregon. Habitat loss and fragmentation of habitat is a primary concern. The natural history of this owl makes it very difficult to assist in its recovery. It is a very, very particular animal. It likes very old trees. It likes very old big trees with lots of very old big trees around it. It doesn't want to cross roads because it gets killed by great horned owls. It breeds every other year. It only maybe has one young a year. It's very picky about its food. It's a very difficult situation. Uh, there's a lot of people working on the recovery, but it, it's a little scary. The American kestrel is the most abundant falcon in North America, but we've been seeing a steady and unknown population decline since the 1970s, and nobody knows what's going on. Habitat alterations, pesticides, climate change, no one cause is evident just don't know what's going on. Here's a graph um, of the population decline from 1966 to 2010. You can see these lines. You know, the, uh, the red is the North American kind of all overall. Uh, New England, whoa. Um, these spicy little falcons really need some help. A really fantastic organization is called the American Kestrel Partnership. Uh, you know, reducing pesticide and rodenticide usage is something that we can do individually. Um, they, uh, kestrels eat a lot of insects and a lot of rodents. So if you're poisoning rodents and poisoning insects, you can poison kestrels too. And this is uh, a mom and dad and three eggs in a cavity. Great thing about kestrels is they nest in cavities and they like to, and they have no problem nesting in man-made cavity boxes. So um, the American Kestrel Partnership can help people um, decide if it's appropriate, you know, maybe in on their property or uh, in other locations to install, monitor, and uh, record nest box activity. And it's a really, really great um, citizen science monitoring activity. So um, it could be that there's not enough nest cavities. So we can put up nest cavities as well for kestrels. So really a charming, charming little falcon. And hopefully we can figure out the cause of their decline sooner rather than later. And I just want to thank you guys all for coming this evening. Um, I hope you learned a little bit about raptors and my rapid fire raptor talk this evening um, about raptors from Oregon. So I think we have a little bit of time.